then it will be our app. At least you can tell when something does DRM. You can tell because you try to do something that ought to be possible and it says you can't do that. Or there's simply nothing in the menu that ever offers you a way to do it. And then you know it was, if it's an obvious thing people would obviously want to do and they don't support it, that's probably because they decided to stop it. Then there are back doors. A back door is a malicious functionality that accepts remote commands from somebody. <coughs> commands to do something nasty to the user. And in general, it is doing something nasty to the user because if it were a favor to the user, it would ask, do you want to do this? It would give you a choice. But with a back door, they don't give you a choice because they don't want you to be able to say no. It's hard to find a back door unless you see it being used. You can't study the code of these proprietary programs, so unless you're lucky or unlucky and you see the back door in operation, you can't tell it's there. But one example we know of is in the Amazon swindle. In 2009, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book in a great Orwellian act of uh, book burning, virtual book burning. Some people saw the book disappear while they were reading it. Somebody came to my talk once and told me that this had happened to him. Well, there was a lot of criticism, so Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. <laughs> right. If you know what 1984 is about, <laughs> that promise is not very comforting, is it? <laughs> but actually, it wasn't a promise. It was just a meaningless noise, something that Amazon could say in order to pull the momentum out from the criticism. It was not a sincere commitment. It had no legal force. What? Which one was it? Oh, it was 1984 by George Orwell. I forgot to say that. Yeah, so I'm sleeping. What can I say? Yeah, they deleted thousands of copies of 1984. And because this was so ironic, the criticism was going very strong. Amazon had to do something, so it made a non-promise that was not a sincere commitment. And a few years later, Amazon returned to remotely erasing books without even an order from the state. Now, we know of a few other backdoors. Uh, there is a backdoor in iOS, the system of the iMonsters, that can remotely erase an app. And there's a backdoor in Google Play, that part of Android, which can remotely erase an app or forcibly remotely install an app. Google could make an app just for you and force it into your Android device. <laughs> then there's censorship. Apple was the pioneer in developing general purpose computers that censor installation of applications. The iPhone was the first such computer in which users could not freely install the application software of their choice. They could only install what was approved by Apple. <laughs> from Apple's store. And uh, when users found ways to get around the censorship to install other programs, they called that jailbreaking, recognizing in effect that these computers were designed as jails for their users. 
So that's our term for such a computer. It's a jail. <clears throat> and uh, then there were universal backdoors. A universal backdoor is a, is a particular kind of backdoor which has the power to remotely change the software. And that means it can do absolutely anything to the poor, helpless user. For instance, Windows has a universal backdoor since Windows XP, at least since Windows XP. It was discovered by people studying the behavior of Windows XP. They demonstrated that it had a universal backdoor, meaning that Microsoft could remotely change the software, forcibly remotely change the software, and thus do absolutely anything to those helpless, defenseless Windows users. Microsoft refused to acknowledge there was a universal backdoor in Windows XP. But in Windows 7, it announced proudly that it had this power. Of course, it didn't use the same name. It called this auto-upgrade. <laughs> but if you think about it, auto-upgrade and universal backdoor are two names for the same thing. There's another universal backdoor that we know of in the Amazon swindle. You might call it uh, 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 total malicious, totally malicious. Every kind of malicious functionality we know of is in there. Also, just about all portable phones have a universal backdoor. And uh, this has been remotely used to convert them into listening devices that listen all the time and transmit all the conversations they hear. And if you think of getting your privacy back by turning it off, oh, one other, you don't have to speak right into the microphone. Even if you're speaking across the room, it can still hear your conversation. It hears all the conversations going on. And if you think you can get your privacy back by turning it off, guess what? There's no off switch. There's no real way to turn the phone off. Instead of an off switch, it has a button that says, Oh, great, sir, telephone. Would you please switch yourself off? And the telephone will either switch itself off or pretend to switch itself off. When they convert it into a listening device, at that point, it never really switches off. Instead, it fakes sw turning off, but it continues running, listening, and transmitting. Because of this, and because the phone sends signals every few minutes saying where to find it, and the phone system can do triangulation and determine the phone's location very precisely, and it records this. Because of this, I call portable phones Stalin's dream. This is exactly what Stalin would have wanted to do to every inhabitant of the Soviet Union. Get them to carry devices that would say all the time where they are and could listen to all the conversations in that place. Stalin would probably have ordered everyone to carry one. But uh, in our not quite so free countries, they have found ways of tempting almost everybody to carry them. But I had good fortune. When I first considered whether to get a mobile phone, these things were already known. I'm not an early adopter of new technology. I'm suspicious of any new technology. So it took a few years after everyone, everyone I knew had a mobile phone before I considered the possibility. And when I did, I found out these things 
And I said, that's disgusting. I absolutely refuse to carry such a thing. And that's why I have never had a mobile phone. I do use mobile phones, other people's. <laughs> Often I use one just once. I'm in a bus and I say, could someone make a call for me? <laughs> Send a text for me? And that way Big Brother doesn't know it's me. <laughs> of course, part of the reason I refuse to carry one is that it disgusts me, the idea of being tracked. But another part is I feel it's my duty as a citizen. We should all be refusing them. I don't, I don't decide for you, but I do decide for me, and so I refuse. And another motivation is it gives me an opportunity to help make people like you aware of how malicious these devices are. And it's all because of non-free software in them. There's another way proprietary software developers can screw people. When Microsoft finds security flaws in Windows, before it fixes them, it shows them to the NSA. <laughs> in other words, Microsoft directly betrays all of its clients, all of its users. <coughs> Do you think the Brazilian government should use Windows? <laughs> Nobody should use Windows. <laughs> but the fact that we know that Microsoft does this does not prove other companies do not do this. We don't know about any other company. We have an absence of evidence. So we know of hundreds of examples of proprietary malware. Look at gnu.org slash proprietary for long lists. But these examples are enough to show that almost everyone that uses proprietary software is in fact using proprietary malware. They're already the victims of this problem. Almost everyone you know. And why do those companies do it? It's not that they're sadists. It's that they have found ways to profit by mistreating their own users. Now, there are thousands of proprietary programs, and most of them I don't know anything about. Most of them we don't know anything about. We, for most of them, we don't know whether they're malware or not. But uh, we can't check either. I'm sure there are some proprietary programs that have no malicious functionalities but we can't identify any one of them because we're not allowed to check the code. For some of these programs, we know of, of malicious functionalities. We know they're malware. For the rest, we don't know. So they're possible malware. We have to suspect they might be malware. But we can never verify that a proprietary program is not malware because they don't let us look at the source code. And even if they said they were showing us the source code, we couldn't tell if it's the real source code. So you must regard every proprietary program as suspected malware. <clears throat> Which means that there is never a rational basis for trusting a proprietary program. Rationally, you should not trust it. The only way to trust it is with blind faith. Often, it's blind faith in a company that has already betrayed its users. And they ask you to trust it again. Well, basically, proprietary software developers are asking you to be a sucker. <laughs> To use proprietary software is to ask to be had. The only software you can rationally trust is free software. With free software, the users have a defense 
against malware. The users control the program, and they can use that control to protect themselves. We developers of free software, we know we, we're safe from the temptation to put in malware because we know we don't have power. We know that the users are ultimately in control, and if they don't like what we've done, they can change it. And not only that, they can check it. Now, with any free program, there are users who are studying parts of the code, usually because they want to fix a bug or add a feature. But at the same time, they would notice if there's anything malicious in that part of the code. So they're always carrying out this defense of, the, of their community against any possible malicious development. And if they ever found such a thing, of course it would be a scandal. So the result is we don't, because we don't have power, we don't get corrupted. We know we don't have power. The proprietary developers, they know they do have power. So, for your freedom's sake, you need to escape from proprietary software and come to live in the free world that we have built. The GNU operating system, together with the Linux kernel, you can use your computer in freedom. The only way to use a computer in freedom is with is to put only free software in it. Because you can never trust a proprietary program. <clears throat> I developed the GNU operating system for the specific purpose of making it possible to use a computer and have freedom. In 1983, which is when I decided to do this, the only way to buy a computer and use it was with a proprietary operating system and that took away your freedom. I could only see one way we could ever run a computer in freedom, and that is if somebody developed a free operating system, so I said, I will. And I started developing GNU in 1984, I started recruiting other people to help develop it, of course. I didn't write it all myself. Mm -hmm. uh, by 1991, GNU was almost complete, but one major essential component was missing, the kernel. The kernel in an operating system is the component that provides the machine's resources to the other programs you use. In 1990, we started developing our own kernel, but that was de that development went very slowly. Perhaps I had chosen uh, a, a design that was too elegant and advanced. It became a kind of research project. It took six years to have a test release, which was a shame. But fortunately, we didn't have to wait for that because in 19, would you be so kind as to move all those stickers over here? because they shouldn't be mixed up with the things that are for sale or cause confusion. Um, so, in 1991, Linux was proprietary. Its license was too restrictive. It didn't completely give people freedoms two and three. However, in 1992, Torvalds changed the license. He adopted a license that was free namely the GNU General Public License, or GNU GPL. Once Linux became free, it was possible to fit Linux into the last gap in the GNU system, producing a, a complete system which was free, and that system was basically GNU, but also contains Linux. And that's the GNU slash Linux operating system. You've probably heard this system referred to as, quote, Linux, unquote. That's an error. It's actually the GNU system and contains Linux also. 
when people call it Linux, they are treating us badly. They're, they're being unfair to us, and it's really not right. Because they're giving the credit for our work to someone else and not giving us any of the credit. Since we started it, and we did the biggest, we developed the biggest fraction of the code for any one project. I think it's fair for us to ask for equal mention. If you say GNU slash Linux, you're giving credit to us, and you're giving credit to Thorvalds. Equal mention. Please make an effort to do that. In principle, GNU slash Linux is a free operating system. In practice, not necessarily. There are thousands of different variants of GNU slash Linux. They're called distros or distributions. Each one has its own development group, and they decide which programs to put in. They can add anything they like. Often, they add some non-free programs, and once they do that, uh, it's not a free operating system anymore. An operating system is a collection of lots of programs, usually thousands of programs. And in order for a collection of programs to be free, each and every component has to be free, with no exceptions. Because if one component is proprietary and it takes your freedom away, then the collection as a whole takes your freedom away. So the, the way to combine these things is with a conjunction. The collection is free if each and every component is free. Well, the unfortunate thing is, of the thousands of distros, about 10 of them are free. Most of the distros are developed by people who don't think of freedom as a value. They think convenience is more important than their freedom and your freedom. So they put non-free programs in, and uh, those distros are non-free. We can't recommend them. Look at gnu.org slash distros for the list of free distros that respect your freedom, and choose those. Also in that directory, you can find information about the well-known distros and why they fail and how they fail to be free. It's important not to promote non-free distros for two reasons. First of all, if you urge people to install a non-free program, any non-free program, you're telling that person, give up your freedom. And you shouldn't say that to people. You're steering them in the wrong direction. But more than that, those distros encourage people not to care about their freedom. Consider, for instance, Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a very well-known distribution. It's non-free. It installs non-free software automatically, and it offers installation of lots more non-free software, and adding insult to injury, when those non-free programs are gratis, they call them free. So they're confusing people about this issue. Now, what about the ethical issues? They could say, the developers of Ubuntu could say to the public, you deserve freedom in your computing and you won't get it from us. They could, but they don't. Because then they'd be criticizing themselves and they don't want to criticize themselves. They prefer instead not to talk about the issue of freedom ever at all. <coughs> so, instead of talking about freedom, they say, we try to give you the best possible user experience. So what they're saying implicitly is, don't value freedom, value your convenience. How do you teach values to people? You do it by basing your words and your actions on those values. Our words and our actions are based on valuing freedom and community. 
Ubuntu's words and actions are based on valuing convenience. How do you make a program free software? You do it by putting on a free license. Under today's copyright law, which is written in, it, it's a bad law for the public's interest. Uh, it should be changed. But the way it actually works is everything that's written is automatically copyrighted. Every program, because it's a written work, is automatically copyrighted. And copyright law by default forbids people to copy it, to change it, to distribute copies, and in some countries it even forbids them to run it unless they get permission. Because in order to run it, you have to copy it into the computer's memory. So how do we make this program free? We do it through a declaration from the copyright holders of the program explicitly giving every user the four freedoms. That license is what has the legal effect of giving the users those four freedoms because it's a statement from the copyright holders. Legally, it gives the users those freedoms. There are many different ways to write a free software license. Uh, the, the different, there are many different free software licenses because they do this job in different ways. But the crucial point is, if a program doesn't have a license, it's proprietary. GitHub is leading users to do things badly. There are many programs posted on GitHub that don't carry any license at all. They're non-free. And yet, many people treat them as if they were free. They're making a bad legal mistake. And those developers are doing a, and a flawed job of contributing to the community because people may use it, but legally they've never been given permission to use it. So they're in legal danger. And those programs don't, are not really available to the community in a legal way. So please don't ever make that mistake. If you participate in a software project, insist on having a free software license clearly stated. And clearly stated means every source file, except tiny ones that are five or ten lines, should have a notice at the top saying what its license is. It's not clear if you just put the license into a file in the directory and then there are 50 source files in the same directory and they don't say anything about their licensing. Well, we could surmise that the file with the license in that directory is meant to apply to these source files. But if it doesn't actually say so, it's not clear. In addition, when you use the GNU GPL, the license at the top of the source file says which license versions you can use. It tells the users which license versions they can use the program under. And it's absolutely vital to say that. Just putting a copy of the GPL into the directory doesn't really tell the users what permissions they've been given. So make sure there is a file, a, a, a license notice at the top of each file saying you can use, this is released under the new general, per, general public license version three or later, for instance. That way the users know that if there's ever a GPL4, they can use it under GPL4. For more information about choosing licenses, look at gnu.org slash licenses slash license recommendations.html. And in general, gnu.org slash licenses gives the information about 
which licenses are free and which are not, and everything in that area. There are two main categories of free licenses. There are weak licenses, we also call them lax permissive licenses or pushover licenses. And then there are copyleft licenses. There are others as well, but I don't have time to be complete in this subject. A lax permissive pushover license says, do anything you like with this company. The problem is it doesn't know how to say no. Yes, it gives users the four freedoms, but it permits something else that harms the community, and that is anyone at all who doesn't respect freedom can take all of that code that, that was free and put it into a proprietary program, which is a, in effect a proprietary <coughs> modified version of the free program. And then that same code is available to other users, but in a way that takes their freedom away. And this is what IBM did in one important case, namely the Apache web server. You've probably heard of that. Uh, it's released as free software under a weak license. And IBM took all that code and put it into a proprietary program which is also a web server program. And as a result, millions of websites are running the code of Apache without the freedom of Apache. And so, that's a bad outcome. I fortunately had seen this kind of bad outcome before I had a GNU program ready for release. So I realized I would have to stop this somehow, and I developed the idea of copyleft, uh, izquierdo autoral, in Portuguese. The idea of copyleft is that when you give the users freedoms two and three, you put on a condition about how they do the redistribution. They are required to redistribute under the same license and to provide the source code. And there's some other specific requirements as well, which all are designed to make sure that when the middleman distributes copies to others, that the others receive from the middleman the same freedoms that the middleman receives from us. So it says, you're allowed to redistribute this code in a way that passes along the freedom, but you are not allowed to turn this code into proprietary software and use it to subjugate other people. And the result is that companies often cooperate with the main developers of the program because they want to make an improved version available and they're not allowed to make a proprietary one. They could release another free version if they wanted to, but, it's a, but they prefer to cooperate with the developers of the main version because that gets better results. It makes the changes they want to release available in an easier way to more users. So mo in most cases, if you release a program, you should copy left it. The GNU General Public License is the specific copy left license that we usually use for, for most GNU programs, and it's the best choice for you to use in most cases for your own software. It's also designed to be suitable for other kinds of things like hardware designs, you can release them under the GNU GPL too. Now, once all the software on your computer is free, there's still a danger that non-free software will sneak into your computer and run, because many web pages contain programs nowadays. Those programs get installed straight into the browser, and then they run, and the browser doesn't even tell you it's running software that you didn't 
intentionally installed. Now these programs can be free or proprietary, just like every other program. Some of them are free and most of them are proprietary. We didn't want our browsers to run those proprietary soft programs, so we developed LibreJS, which is a program that it's an add-on for Firefox, and it checks those programs to see if they're free or trivial. And if they're either free or trivial, they're permitted to run. But if they're non-free and non-trivial, then LibreJS blocks them. And it offers you a list. You can see whether the page has anything that was blocked. And it also gives you an easy way, a quick way, to send a complaint to the webmaster. If you've ever tried to complain to webmasters, you know the hardest part is searching for where and how to communicate to them. LibreJS Libre searches heuristically through the site to find how to contact the webmasters so that you can do it very quickly. And all you have to put in is, I couldn't use your site because it wanted me to run some non-free software. Uh, please fix that and it inserts automatically the details, so you don't have to. If you, you could complain to 10 different sites every day in 10 minutes, and that's a useful thing to do. It puts pressure on them to fix their problem. There's another way that you can lose control over your computing activities. You know, the old way that we used to think about was running a non-free program. Whatever activity is done by the non-free program, the users don't have control over it. And that's, of course, still threatening our freedom, but now there's a second way, the same re bad result can happen. And that is service as a software substitute. When a service offers to do your own computing activity, it's inviting you to lose control of that activity. Because you don't control the programs that are in somebody else's server, and you shouldn't control them. It's per server, so a person should have be able to install the programs of per choice. But that means whatever per server does for you, the person controls it, and you don't. So if you ever entrust your own computing activity to a server run by someone else, you're losing control over it. For your freedom's sake, don't do that. We used to use the term SaaS, meaning software as a service. But then we realized that that's actually a broader term. It includes various other situations as well, and maybe they're not all bad. So now we use a clearer and more specific term, service as a software substitute. It's when the service offers to do a job that in principle you could do in your own computer if you had the right program. And whenever that's possible, it's because the activity is purely yours. If the activity is purely yours, then with the right program, you could do it in your own computer. And therefore, if you would trust that activity to, to a computer run by somebody else, you lose the control you should have. But those are not the only activities we do. There are things we do with computers that are not personally ours because they're joint activities that involve others. They're forms of communication. Now, if you are communicating with me through computers, that's not entirely my activity. It's also not entirely your activity. It's not anybody's personal activity. And in those cases, I can't expect to have total control over it, and neither can you. And in those cases, it may be, it may be sensible and legitimate to use a server as part of that communication. And it's inescapable anyway, because if we want my computer and your computer to talk with each other, they're going to have to talk through the network, which has all sorts of gateways and everything else. So basically, there are two kinds of activities. There are the personal activities that 
are entirely personally yours and you should have full control over. And then there are the communication activities which you couldn't possibly have full control over. So this issue applies to the activities that are personally yours. That, in those activities, if you don't have full control, somebody's mistreating you. So we want to be free, but there are obstacles. One of them is social inertia. The companies, I better put this up here so I can sit on the chair. So the companies that distribute proprietary software, some of them get lots of money. 